Um, okay. Um, so, welcome everyone. Let's start. We'll see, of course, what comes and, uh, and, and uh, the other people and our two friends. What are we? Got the names now. Um, so, we're talking to now about the chapter called Dialect zur Sprache, the way to language, from the book On the Way to Language. Um, and um, in so far, uh, let's see, we have one more week, right? Yeah, we have one more session before Christmas after this one, uh, in which we will look at a chapter called Words. Uh, that's what. Um, so that's, that will be the last of, uh, of, of, of the book. And so we're in an important chapter now, because we've talked about various ways, Heidegger's views on the nature of language, what language is. Um, but the title of the book, we've talked about the title before, in the Weeks of Sprache, is about the way to language. And so um, we have spoken about the, the being of language, or the essence of language, the basic of Sprache. Um, but we haven't spoken about the way to it. And that is what we are talk, thinking about today. On the, so we're focusing, we, we talked last time about this concept of the way a little bit. Um, but I think, or a construct concept, it's a, an idea, or it's a word, um, that we can hear in a certain way. So we're going to now talk about the way to language. Um, and we'll do that by just going over this chapter as we did before. Um, again, this is very, uh, very difficult. <laughs> this is very difficult, and like I did last time, I'll, I'll uh, uh, write down a few things. Um, actually, I wanted to, uh, let me see if I can quickly find that. I wanted to, um, Brain, but we didn't have time to print it. Novalis, short fragment, the monologue. Mm -hmm. do, we, do you know it, or should I put it up? Do we all know it? No, no, no. Oh, you don't no, know it? No, no. This is the English translation. Oh, this is by Joyce. Translation by Joyce Crick, who uh, used to attend the seminar. Yeah. Um, but that was uh, probably the German version. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very short fragment, and the, the point that uh, Novalis makes is that language is only concerned with itself. And Heidegger refers to that. Es ist eigentlich um das Sprechen und Schreiben eine närrische Sache. Das rechte Gespräch ist ein bloßes Wortspiel. Der lächerliche Irrtum ist nur zu bewundern, dass die Leute meinen, sie sprechen und an Dingen willen. Gerade das Eigentümliche der Sprache, dass sie sich bloß um sich selbst bekümmert, weiß keiner. Darum ist sie ein so wunderbares und fruchtbares Geheimnis, dass an einem nur spricht und zu sprechen, er gerade die herrlichsten, originellsten Wahrheiten ausspricht. Speaking and writing is a crazy state of affairs, really. True conversation is just a game with words. 
It is amazing the absurd error people make and imagining they are speaking for the sake of things. No one knows the essential thing about language, but is concerned only with itself. That is why it is such a marvelous and fruitful mystery, for if someone merely speaks for the sake of speaking, he utters the most splendid original truths. But if he wants to talk about something definite, the whims of language make him say the most ridiculous false stuff. Yeah. I think that's an experience that I uh, hope that I, I have certainly had a lot, a lot of the times. When, you, when you're not guarding yourself, you say the most, uh, most uh, wonderful things. And when you try to, to say something, you're at lost for words and you don't know what to say. And that can last a lifetime, that sort of thing. So that is, um, that is a, and, and Hegel begins with that. Um, and right at the beginning of the of the chapter, you know? and then he, he starts to then well of course in 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 the Valis that takes a very different turn and becomes a, 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 a the foundation for a romantic conception of language, language as a thing of its own, with a will of its own, um, and concerned with itself in a certain way, uh, it becomes a, a something of the self. Whereas in uh, in, in Heidegger, of course, he, he reads that in a much deeper way. In a way that um, draws almost a parallel between his critique of uh, Humboldt and what he might say about Novalis, that it is a kind of thing, there is some kind of an intuition there, but it is lost in the structure of Romanticism, idealist thought, and it remains a matter of uh, not understanding the language entirely on its own. So let me make this. As we do, uh, of what we need to discuss. So we need to discuss this point of language is concerned with itself. Mm -hmm. Language is concerned with itself. Then I think we need to make a note of this word uh, alphagis. Uh, what is it translated as? A tear, maybe. Is that the word? Did you. Uh... Uh, maybe a cut? Or is it a cut? Uh, the one. A break? Well, when he, he, he speaks about the, left, the, the meaning of the sign, sinium, secare. Yeah, that one, yeah, the cut. The cut, he calls it the cut, yeah. So, cut, and in German he says, Ophris. And indeed, sign, signum, was related to saccade, to cut. Yeah? That's, by the way, also the root of the word sex. Sexus. Um, so that's, that's a point, and then uh, we get to this, uh, this weaving, or this uh, geflecht, and we get the formula, the, the main formula of this uh, chapter, or this text, is Die Sprache als die Sprache zur Sprache. Uh, how does he translate that? We try to speak about speech qua speech. speech. To speak about speech qua speech. Die Sprache als Sprache zur Sprache bringen. Now, if I ask what is, uh, what is the, why is that an inadequate translation? Can somebody explain that? To, to say, to speak about speech qua speech. Uh, I mean, I could not think of a better translation, but it is a wrong translation. Does anybody, can anybody say why? I 
what is lost in translation here, God would actually say that's that's again something very deep. I think probably in the English translation, so I understand you speak about speech, past speech. So speech or the language is not cannot be considered as, as a subject but as an object. So speak yeah. about speech. So there is a subject who speak about speech and qua speech. So either it is an object or it is a medium, but it is something that to be used by another subject. So I think in this translation there is another subject to uh, implicit. But um, like people, for example. Who does this? Who does it? Yeah. Yeah. But in the German uh, uh, version, die Sprache als die Sprache zur Sprache bringen. So the subject is actually the language itself. Okay. So it is basically say. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure why Sprache is translated as speech. So I'm not sure to which one here should be translated as speech, but which one should be translated as language. Yeah, so we first have that problem, yeah. and we get to that also in the text, because Harry does talk about all this point, but of course the, the yeah, so the, the, next, the next is uh, on our list before we never come back to it. This is of course the saga and what saga is, and then we have uh, a saying, and then we have this Zeichen Sikum or sign, and we have Zeigen to show. Is that the word that they use probably? Yeah. yeah. To show. Yeah. Zeichen. Zeigen. Zeichen with a hard G, Zeichen mm -hmm. is sign, yeah. Zeichen and Zeichen. Zeigen is to show. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, uh, he says that in, with the Stoic philosophers, Zeichen and Zeigen split off from each other. That's what happens in Plato's uh, Allegory of the Sun, as it were. That's, that is, that's, the, that's the whole problem. Is that 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 Zeichen and Zeigen are no longer experiences belonging together? Yeah? Uh, but we get to that. And, and and, sorry. But there's also Zeichnen and Zeichnen, yeah, the, 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 which is here translated as design. Right? Design, yeah. Zeichnen, bit Zeichnen, Zeichnen, and then that's design from also from to, to hear the to hear the sign in, in design, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's a very confusing translation. Very confusing <laughs> translation, yeah? <laughs> and then we have this Ereignis, which is also related to Brauch. Brauchen, to need, or to, to, to have to have, or to, to, to use, but also to, uh, also to custom. And, uh, and, 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 yeah, need is something. Actually, the word, uh, yeah. So we said, I, I told you before that if you speak Dutch, this all of this is not problematic at all, because because uh, we have the word for we have the word for for, for language, which is as um, he talks about the fact that language is always taken. The word for language is taken from the the, the, the tongue, language or language or from speaking. Sprache, uh, whereas language originally is a bringing together into a belonging together, and and that is that is we, we see that in in the word uh, to count. <coughs> we, said this anyway. we see that in the word to count, zählen, uh, zahl, uh, as number, which is a but he says that's a mere numbering, whereas whereas this this zahlen or zählen, echt zählen, to 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 tell. To recount is the, the is the, that's the nature of language. That's what language is: it's bringing these th bringing things together in a real belonging. That is, uh, and 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 in the fact that our human languages don't 
have that as a name for language, you see the, the alienation from, from the essence of language. That we say tongue or mouth, or tongue or, or uh, uh, sp speech, rather than what language really is. So that's what it means <coughs> on the way to language. The way to language is to bring it back to that. You see? For the Dutch, it's no, no problem, because it, for the, in Dutch, the word for language is taal. And taal is tellen. Mm -hmm. And that is tellen. That is, has this tail in it. So the Dutch word for language is tail, not language from langue or tongue or speech. Sprache, but tail. Yeah? So, and, and the word for eigenis is gebeurtenis. Uh, and the, the, the beur, B -E -U -R, B-E-U-R, beuren, is to carry, it's related to, to, to bear, to bear, or in, to, to, in, in born, you have the same thing. Um, and he says that in the text as well. Yeah? So the likeness is related to, to this uh, Austrag. So um, that's just on the side. It's not important. Um, so these are things we need to talk about. Now back to this translation first. Die Sprache als Sprache zur Sprache bringen. Well, he seems to be saying that when we start to talk about, well, when we start to speak of language, or when people start to talk about what language is, um, and he says the whole, die ganze Sprachwissenschaft, alle Sprachtheorie, und Sprachphilosophie, jeder Versuch der Sprache nachzusehen, has, has falls into this, you can't call it a trap, but it falls into this um, strange thing that language pushes us away from understanding what it is. Um, because we, so, Humboldt, and he talks about Humboldt here in some detail. I remember we started with the Humboldt uh, paragraph. Humboldt, he says, talks about language as um, one of the ways in which the spirit expresses itself, comes to itself, manifests itself. But there are also other ways in which the spirit manifests itself. So, um, language is just one of them. And that means that if you understand language as that, as one of the ways in which the spirit expresses itself or comes to itself, then um, you are not understanding language as such. You are understanding it in terms of something else. And that's, of course, a normal procedure. When you want to explain something, you explain it not in not terms of itself, but in terms of something else that helps to explain it. Nevertheless, as philosophers, as those who try to think the essence of things, we want to understand things in their own terms. And that is also true for language. So that's what that's the the yeah, that's why he says in the footnote at the beginning of the I don't know if that's translated, I'm going to check it now. No, in the German text, for those who have read the German text, there is a footnote. On the title, Der Weg zur Sprache, The Way to Language. And in the footnote it says, Why not a way, among others, to language? Why the way? <coughs> and then it says, Well, this, this lecture tries to notice and to let notice and to name the peculiar nature, character of language. In the fragmentation of unscheinbare rufen. I want to attempt to translate that. Um, the way to language is what we're, what we're talking about. And it's the way to language. That, why that the? Because we are trying to understand die Sprache als Sprache. We're trying to bring die Sprache als Sprache. Zur Sprache. Ja, dus dat is ook niet 
one way of doing that. And here you see already a little bit of the what we all talked about last time, the, the, the Adorno's uh, critique of Heidegger, that he, he tries to make it into something unique that he says it the way it is. And there's no other way of saying it. You have to say it like this, otherwise you, you miss it. Yeah. That, that, that sort of thing. Um, why is that a bad translation? There is this thing about the subject, yes, but, but the subject is also, also not clear in the, in the, in the German. It, it mixes it up uh, to speak about that, that's a translation of zu Sprache bringen, speech, die Sprache, als Sprache, qua speech. Sprache yeah? als Sprache, speech qua speech, speech as such. Why speech and why not language? Because of the late, later on, he talks about uh, uh, sprach, the word Sprache, and, the, and the, the closest word for that is speech. Uh, but there's already, you have to realize that he's talking about language and not about, uh, he's talking about the fact that we name language either by the tongue or by, the, by, by, by speech, but, but in German it's by, by speech and in, and in English it's by the tongue. Uh, and that's why, why it's difficult to translate this. It, you don't lose that in translation, but you lose something else in translation, that's what I wanted to say. Zur Sprache bringen means to, uh, to, to raise. Yeah? Etwas zur Sprache bringen means to, to raise a topic, or to uh, you know to talk about yeah to, in loose sense to talk about something, but of course literally it means to bring something to language. So this this bringing, you know, how do you use the word without reason? This this bringing is uh, that's the key word here. That's the carrying. <laughs> that's the carrying that lies at the root of what kindness. Where I get that later on. Yeah? And Zursprache bringen also implies um, a way. It implies that we, we, we are here and we carry it there. So we carry it back to itself. Um, in other words, this whole notion of the way to language lies already in that phrase in the form of the phrase. It is like Edgar Allan Poe's purloined letter, that the answer to the question lies right in front of you, now, but you don't see it. So he pushes, tries to bring us back to some... So he starts with saying that, how could we... That, what, why is there a way to language necessary? We are already speaking. Right? Um, that, that could not be a place to language, to, to language because we are already there. So you can't go to where you already are. No? Or in case that the hit, the, the blockages, the obstacles, so probably in English. That the obstacles, yeah, not just those, but the way lined with obstacles that come from language itself. As soon as our reflection tries to pursue language straight into its own without ever losing sight of it. Or is it rather the case that this, this confusion about language or the need to go away to language, that these come that this comes out of the nature of language. Yes, it is that way, according to Heidegger. Uh, I thought about, I hadn't really thought about this before in such a clear way, but you remember that Heraclitus, in the beginning of Greek philosophy, says, uh, nature likes to hide. That's a famous line, yeah? Nature likes to hide. And uh, uh, I think that plays a big role in, in history of Western thought. 
very, very big role. Um, you also find it in, 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 in the Stoic ethics, it becomes very important. Uh, the, and even Descartes says at the beginning of uh, Descartes has a, had a, as his, his personal motto that benefixit beniculatuit. He has lived well who has hidden himself well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a stoic idea, and that that's related to this notion of nature as that which likes to hide. Now, in Heidegger, being also likes to hide, and language likes to hide, right? But how can you hide? You can only hide if something is manifest, that, that which you are hiding behind, as it were. Or you can only hide if you're out of out of sight, out of view, so something else has got to be in view. Yeah, maybe that's kind of an associative way to think about it. So Heidegger's and, and, and what is a key term in Heidegger's philosophy is uh and there, uh, Aletheia as uh, unconcealment. unconcealment. I always lose the word, yeah. As unconcealment. It's the quite the opposite of nature that likes to hide. Heidegger even interprets the term physis, nature in Greek, as that which shows itself out of itself. Right? As a spontaneous self manifesting. That, that is that is that is the na nature. Yeah? So he is and Remember that he's all the time saying it's not so much about metaphysics or wrong, but it's about saying metaphysics doesn't think deep enough, doesn't think its own root, where it comes from. And if you think of metaphysics as a way of thinking that goes for presence, for what is present, um, then uh, obviously it is, it's almost as if metaphysics is being its little game uh, I mean, with us, yeah, while it hides. So it is the it is the, the hiding game of uh, of being that is um, yeah. Just as some religious authors have written about, in I think in Hinduism maybe more than in uh, in Western thought about. Uh, uh, the, the world being a, the, the game that God plays with, with, with uh, him or ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a manifestation of, of him or herself, and, he, and God is hiding, hiding behind us, as it were. Yeah. Um, so, there is a, and why I'm saying this, to point out that there is, there is a kind of, at the deeper level, there is a kind of relation going on here between hiding and revealing, and, um, and, uh, and, and that's also the whole point about language. Language is, he says that, is uh, language is this um, showing, yeah? That's the Aufriss, yeah? Uh, but but in doing that, it makes itself unseen, um, and that is why. So language is what you do when you don't know you're doing it. Yeah. Or you mediate in any sense. Yeah. Is it? Is it a bit self-handling as well? You're writing so much about what language is. Yes, okay, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, no? Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no,
I know why it was ever an ending. Yeah, but um Yeah, I see a point. Is there a, a is there a Is animal language ever in the discussion? Do they speak in more pure language? But is it about civilization again and human? Um... The, the, the animal has no language, by, uh, because the animal has no world. Huh. Yeah. So, so that that which shows the language is what, in the end, is organized language. Because they don't, animals don't yes. have a system, so the way of showing language in the end is grammar makes language then. Well, that is, I think that is a very good point. Um, all that belongs to language. Yeah? Bori, you want to say something? Yeah, well, I just want to say um, I'm not sure what exactly kind of theory uh, of language Heidegger has here. But it just reminds me that the last time you, you uh, talk about the um, language of thoughts, this this book written by Fodor, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, if you consider language as um, mm -hmm. like in terms of words, in terms of pronunciation, like sounds, I think in that sense, and we also have language. But um, many um, cognitive philosophers and also analytical philosophers, they don't think that is language. Language is more than just pronunciation yeah. or more than sounds. So in, the, in this book, what which um, uh, Johan talked about is uh, there are also theories about uh, language where languages understand uh, um, thoughts in a sense of conceptual matter. So um, you, you have languages. In different languages, there are conceptions. And also there is this, uh, uh, and some concepts are uh, are um, present in some languages, but not in other languages. For example, if you say, um, in, in German, there is this firm way, so you feel itchy that you want to go somewhere far away. But this concept is is uh, absent um, in, for example, English or other languages. So in order to bring that concept in German languages, to bring in, 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 in English, you have to find a much longer way to describe the concept in order to make the concept. So yeah. the language is the space between the different meanings of different concepts. I mean, that is one. That is one theory, and and according to that theory, there's there might be one way to explain whether uh, an animal has languages, and, that, and in that sense, that animal does not have uh, uh, languages because in that sense you have to uh, explain. Uh, in which condition is a concept possible. And this has something to do like, for example, with time, how you conceive something as a concept, something symbolic. And then it might be developed into a dimension where at least we can say we're not sure whether, because we haven't seen any obvious um, proof to make up, to convince us that um, animals are able to think like that. And I think in that sense, we may be able to prove that uh, an animal does not have languages. Um, I mean, just to, because I raised my hand when you, when you asked yeah, yeah, yeah. about whether an animal has languages. Now, so, um, Heidegger makes this, Heidegger then starts to talk about speaking, sprechen, and he says, yeah, there's a, you move all that stuff around, that's, you know, speaking. But, uh, but, but, but then he makes a distinction between speaking and saying. And so that already moves us away from Sprache as a word to Zahlen. And he says, saying, well, you can, you can say a lot by not saying anything. Yeah? And so, so that, that, that's related maybe to this question of is it, is it that in the grammar and in the articulation? Yes, it is in, in articulation is very important, but he says that also language is verlautbarum, so is, is articulation literally, but um, it is it is that in order to say something, and you can say with very little words a lot, and with a lot of words you can say nothing. So that so so, so that, that seems to me on the one hand to say if you want to talk about the animal question, well um, animals can say a lot, <laughs> well maybe I don't know can they yeah. Yes, I think, yeah, probably you can. Um, 
but they don't they don't articulate in, in language, maybe articulate it in other ways. Um, but you could also say, well, no, because you need to articulate before you can say something, although not all articulation means that you are saying something. I don't know, this, this, that doesn't really address the question, right? No, I'm just thinking that it's a little bit reductive, to be honest. For this sort of philosophy that sees language as something that is evolved, that is something pure up there, if you apply it to human and then you can't apply it to animal, even though there is communication between human and animal in some sort of language, my cat meows to me. I understand that, you know, that we, we do. I, I say his name and he understands me. Yeah. That's, that's my, my, my problem with this, um, with this idea of speaking or, um, to me, it's it's very rapid how it goes from a universal idea to something very specific through human speech or very reductive. It, it gives like humans like a magic ingredient to animals, um, but animals don't have it. It doesn't fit in with the science very well, like the theory of evolution that we gradually emerged from animals, and I think it's. Um, ascribing to is this property of, of saying that um, is connected to sh to showing in some way, or is, is that kind of maybe, yeah, I think I see where you're coming from, that it doesn't seem to fit in with like, um, like nat naturalism is like um, seeing humans as part of the uh, part of nature and the animal kingdom. I mean, if this system is the only thing that shows language, if showing language, would, yeah, if showing language is a system and a grammar, then that that is that um, excludes any other form of communication, including silence, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mean, I don't know. I, yeah, I think that this text is very well organized. By the end of it, he does uh, he does show a system, yeah. but the separate parts are a bit confusing. Okay, well we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we as we go on. Um, in my cat. Yeah. You're not interested in my cat. No, I'm very interested <laughs> in your cat. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course I am. Uh, I just don't know what to do with this. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I know, I'll, I'll just record him next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now what I wanted to do, yeah, so maybe one way to, to also to come back to this language of thought point. So you could say it's reductive, you could also say, wow, what a lot of words. Um, to say something, well, actually, isn't it, isn't it here saying something very simple, namely that. Um, and that's a point that's been noted by many philosophers throughout history, um, that knowledge is possible. So we don't know how, maybe not, we don't know how it's possible, or you know, you, we can be skeptical, but there is something that we might call intelligibility. There is intelligibility. And that and as Plato already says in the Theatetos, uh, there's no way of understanding how that is possible. <laughs> yeah, there is a, there is a, you know, that with philosophers among you know is uh, the, the get get here uh, problem, right? Uh, that very short article uh, written by uh, get get here. Do you know, do you know, have you read it? Yeah. Four pages or so, never anything else. I'm um, very famous with it, saying that, that knowledge is not justified true belief, as the, the known definition goes. But of course, that is what Plato already says in the in the of the whole point of the dialogue is to show that that is seems to be the, the only definition you can give, but it's not enough because it doesn't it doesn't talk about acquaintance. It does talk about the fact that something is given for for me and that I don't become it when I know it. So there is both a distance and a difference and 
and a kind of identity that, is, that, is, that happens in, in thought, uh, in, in knowing, in the relation of knowing. Um, that's the only way I can put it. So, knowledge seems to me to be something deeply mysterious, but it is this, the fact that something is there to be known at all, is intelligibility. Uh, and you can take that either into a very far way, as Hegel does, and says there's utterly nothing that's not in the can that can be nothing that's not intelligible, or you can take it in a very minimal sense. We don't know what intelligibility really means. It may be the case that we don't think we know something, but actually we don't. Um, but nevertheless, even then, the fact states that there is whatever it is. There is something we call knowledge, and. Um, how is what Heidegger is saying not simply that? So, um, look at uh, uh, section 2, where he starts to talk about it after he has dealt with Humboldt and said, well, that's still a way of understanding language, not as language, but as an activity of the mind. Um, he then begins to say, when, well, we reflect on language Qua language, we have abandoned the traditional procedure of language study. Sinnen wir der Sprache als der Sprache nach? That's also for those who the German speakers among you is a very pompous uh, formulation, I think. Dann haben wir das bislang übliche Vorgehen einer Sprachbetrachtung aufgegeben. We now can no longer look for general notions such as energy, activity, labor, power of the spirit, worldview, expression, under which to subsume language as a special case. Instead of explaining language in terms of one thing or another and thus running away from it, the way to language, the Sprache zur Sprache bringen, intends to let language be experienced as language. Right? Die Sprache als Sprache zur Sprache bringen. In the nature of language, to be sure, language itself is conceptually grasped, but grasped and grasped for something other than itself. But now we're going to attempt the language itself as such. And then he says, okay, uh, speaking, so, so how does language initially present itself to us as speech? As what, what we do now. That, that's, that, that's the that language. Yeah? Um, and that means uh, that you have to have speakers. <laughs> yeah? So you can't have language without speakers. Um, zum Sprechen gehören die Sprechenden. Speaking must have speakers. You see how, tr you could say, how great Heidegger is as a writer, or how treacherous. In the German, he says, zum Sprechen gehören die Sprechenden. That means to speaking belong speakers. Here translated as speaking must have speakers. He is making that lapidary point. Yeah, you can't have spe speech without speakers. But at the same time, we now know already, after having come to page 239 of the book, that gehören is not a neutral word for Heidegger. Gehören, hören auf die Sprache, listen. Listening to language, being obedient to language, to, to hear language before you speak, speak only when you're spoken to, that is the, the essence of the human relation to language, is hören, to sprechen gehören sprechen. Okay, but that's so, okay, so that's already, so it's like that, it's like die Sprache als Sprache zu Sprache bringen. If you get it, then you see the whole, the whole philosophy in, in that clinical sentence. But then he goes on, and he says, so we're going to intelligibility. Then he, then he goes on, to sprechen gehören die Sprechenden, aber nicht nur so wie die Ursache zur Wirkung, but not merely in the same way as an effect must have a cause. Right? So, the relation between the speaker and their language is not one of cause and effect in either way. This is a very important point. Die Sprechenden haben viel mehr 
in Sprechen wir anwesend. Rather, the speakers are present in the way of speaking. Speaking, they are present, and together with those with whom they speak, in whose neighborhood they dwell, because it is what happens to concern them at the moment. Die Sprechenden haben vielmehr im Sprechen ihr Anwesen, wohin? Auf das hin, directed towards that, womit sie sprechen, wobei sie verweilen als dem, was sie je und je bereits angeht. Das sind nach ihrer Weise die Mitmenschen und die Dinge. Ist alles, was diese bedient und jenen bestimmt. That includes fellow men and things, namely everything that conditions things and determines man. All this is addressed in word, each in its own way, and therefore spoken about and discussed in such a way that speakers speak to one another, speak to and with one another, and to themselves. So, what we get here is to, to detach the relation between speaker and speak and language from the frame of causality. To speak, to other meanings, or to talk about something to someone, or to, yeah, is not a, a matter of causal activity. Okay, that already fits in well with the fact that, that we don't have a scientific view of language. Yeah? That's a very, very important point here. Because it, that, that, that says something quite fundamental, that our speaking is not a form of cause-effect relationship. So that the view of expression, language is expression of thoughts, is more or less cause effect. I've got a thought, I express it, uh, express it in, in a word, and the thought causes the word. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not like that. In language, we are with others, we are with things, we are, uh, we, we, are uh, uh, we, we dwell, right, he says, in whose neighborhood they dwell. Uh, how does he say that here? We can't find that. So, and it seems to me that all these words, dwelling, being with, it's not causal, they, it's being present with or to something or someone, they all indicate to me um, intelligibility. They all indicate to me that the knowledge relation is also not a causal relation, and that is something that I don't think but you have to be a cognitive scientist to, 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 to doubt that. Yeah? So, no, so no one in the right mind doubts that. <laughs> that, that knowledge of causal relation. Um, and so, 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 yeah, okay, that, but that is my... Do you see what I'm saying? How... So, why do we bring in Sprache? And then later on, we're going to say, well, actually, Sprache is Sage, and Sage is table as bringing together under it, bringing together of things. Are we not just sort of playing with a lot of associative words and concepts that have to do with really the peculiarity of the relation of intelligibility? The, the fact that there is a world for me to understand, which is not the same as I, I respond causally to. to, to uh, my, 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 what I say, what I see, is the effect of of a cause, or, um, or when I know something, I have a causal relation to it, um, where I something is affecting something in another, or influencing something in another. The the the, the yeah, okay, that's my point. <laughs> um, and that, so that's one way of saying, of, of opening up the, the, the thing. So is Heidegger that himself also secretly trying to, uh, is he not go, going away from Sprache as Sprache zu Sprache? Because he's not really talking about Sprache anymore. He's talking about, um, what it means to have a world. And that, 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 that means what it means to know. Um, have, and of course that is in a fundamental way mediated by language or exists in language. Um, so that, that becomes a question then, yeah? And, and then uh, we get that 
are going very quickly now, but then we get Zeige and the Zeichen and the Zeichnen, and then we are very close to uh, a language of thought. We're very close to a conceptual map in which we cut things up. Yeah. Or you could at least see how you could, how, how you could make it work in that way. Okay, so I'm going to stop now. Uh, Federico, you, you look uh, as if you had something on your mind. <laughs> well, two things. Uh, the first is that it's not that problematic, this thing in, um, of uh, uh, detach, detaching from uh, cause effect framework, I think. And uh, so for me, it's not that surprising that he is uh, trying to avoid it. Uh, the, I, I, I find some more striking problems in what's next. So, and when he introduced uh, introduces the, the unspoken, so something that uh, no matter how you speak, no matter what you say, still remains aside from, from the conversation or from the speech. And uh, this is uh, clearly related with, in the, in, in the, next, in the next page, he, he speaks about a mystery. Um, in his words, that which must remain wholly unspoken is held back in the unsaid, abides in concealment as unshowable, is a mystery. So, this is for me mm, at the same time interesting and problematic because, okay, maybe we can we cannot understand uh, everything in terms of. Um, we cannot look at language in terms of cause and effect, and it's fine. Uh, there is something present in our conversation. There is this, uh, Heidegger speaks about this saying in the conversation. Uh, but there is, let's say, a part of this saying in the conversation which cannot be shown. And so, since he's, he says that uh, the principle of property of language is showing at the same time there's something in language which cannot be shown. Yeah. So, despite the fact of showing, uh, that showing is the primary uh, property of language. Yeah. So, and, and this is for me just a bit more complicated to, to grasp. <laughs> This is the first part. Okay, yeah, good, good. yeah, good. Okay, yeah. Wait, the second one. Okay, and the second is just uh, we've we've talked about it um, other times. Uh, he insists a lot of um, of the word experience. So we uh, rather than uh, speaking about language, rather than providing a systematic logic account of what language is, we should better. Uh, experience it. And I was wondering um, whether the experience of going through the way of language uh, is, uh, is for us a mimetic, a, a mimetic experience. Because uh, it seems to me that uh, we can uh, like build it, that, uh, it seems to me the Heidegger is building a chain, starting from uh, the, the common experience of speaking, and well, I just want to get here. So from from uh, uh, from speaking, uh, identifying saying as uh, the main. Uh, the main thing that happens in speaking, and then showing as uh, the proper activity of saying, mm -hmm. and then from there owning and appropriating, so till the uh, till he reaches the arrivals, and then, but but this is 
our way to language, and then he turns this way up, like upside down. Or, and uh, speaking of the proper way of language, uh, which is from the eigenness to, um, yeah. to, to, to the speaking. Yeah. And I was wondering whether uh, going through this chain from speaking to the eigenness is a mimesis of, uh, of the movement uh, of uh, Agnes towards us. Yes, of course. But in the other and I, yes, it, 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 I mean, there are these two directions. Yeah. And is it possible to uh, look at this way to language as a mimesis of the way of language towards us? Yeah. So, uh, in, in a certain sense, he doesn't provide uh, a proper argument for what language is. But he, Heidegger seems to invite us to go through it, and this is the only possible argument when it comes to uh, understandable languages. This is how I yeah. have understood the, 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 the whole chapter. I don't understand your last remark, but that this is the only way, what do you mean? Because if we want to avoid um, a cause-effect description, if you want to avoid what could be generally said a scientific account of language, so what he calls speaking about language. The only way of uh, understanding what the state is imitating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, yes, to, to, to become, to come it. To be yeah. in a certain sense, yeah. to become it, but from the opposite point of view. So from the point of view of what he calls mortals. Yeah. The, yes, yes, yes. Just exactly. these two remarks. We, sorry, and that's a good point because we left that, that line at last time and the relation between death and language. Um, that's right. Um, yeah. Okay, so we have silence. Or no, what, what cannot we say? There are things that have not been said, but that might be said. Mm -hmm. But there's also something that cannot be said in a fundamental way, right? So that was your first point. Yes. And then your second point was that this mimetic structure, that in that the way to language can never be to talk about language. That can be to 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 accomplish ourselves the relation between us and, and the and the event, the right likeness, but from our perspective, and then we come to see that actually it goes also the other way. Exactly. Yeah? And then and then we once we have achieved that insight, then we can we can then genuinely speak. Because then, then we know what it is to speak. That maybe you could put it like that. Then, then we then we have a, a relation to language that is no longer verstellt, that's no longer twisted um, by this 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 hiding of, of language. It's not the case that language doesn't hide anymore, but we know it, and we don't think that it doesn't. But then we could make it all come out into the open or something. Yeah, we then have a relation to what is what remains mysterious or absent or uh, out of view. Uh, what remains hidden? What remains yeah hidden in hidden. Yeah. Um, okay. So and then and then then the, the last, last point was. That that has something to do with mortality. With our maybe maybe better word is finitude. Yeah. So so we have to experience ourselves as finite in order to for us to have a relation a, a genuine relation to language. Um, yes, the, what he calls the the needfulness, the 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 power. Yeah. 
So uh, this is our condition, our let's say necessary condition, uh, which orients our um, sight towards the language. So we cannot, we, we, we can go through this way of language just from speaking to language and, uh, sorry, from speaking to the writings and not uh, the opposite precisely because of, of our finitude. Yeah. This exactly. is how I understand it. Yeah. Mortals, he said in the last lecture, mortals are they who can experience death as death. So they can experience that they will no longer be there. See the parallel with experiencing language as language. Yeah. Animals cannot do so. But animals cannot speak either. The essential relation between death and language flashes up before us, but remains still unthought. It can however beckon us toward the way in which native language draws us into its concern and so relates us to itself in case death belongs together with what reaches out for us, touches us. Assuming that the mover which holds the world's four regions in the single nearness of their face-to-face -face encounter rests in saying, that only saying confers what we call by the time the word is. And the say after saying. Saying releases it is into life and freedom and therewith into the security of its thinkability. Saying releases the is into life and freedom and therewith into the security of its thinkability. There you have the intelligibility. Yeah. Saying releases. So, so language is somehow necessary for intelligibility to come around. And that is the same as being able to think death as death, uh, or experience death as death. If we were not, then, then if, if you maybe there's some idea that if you were completely. Uh, uh, if you have no limitations in your in your knowing, then um, you would not have a world. Then you would be the world. Yeah. So if you think of uh, just in a very simple way, so we live sitting here in this room, and you think, okay, I see this room. Yeah. But now imagine I'm sitting here. This is my head here. I see this room. But imagine that your your field of vision occupies every thinkable position in this room. Under the table, on the table, on the table. Yeah, every, all of that at once. Yeah? Then you see that, that there would be no perception. There would be no perspective, there would be no Adumbration. There would be there has to be something you cannot see for there to be to be a, a stable world. So you, so so the mind that is everywhere, although it, that that becomes just a chiffre, just a, just a kind of thing that we might postulate. We don't know what it what it what it would be because we cannot really literally imagine that we would even in this one little room that we would look at everything from every possible perspective at the same time. A sort of mind blowing thought. Um, you need finitude. And so, and you, you, you might say in this mythical language here, language, Sprache as such, in, in this mythic relation, gives finitude and, and remains hidden itself. In, in it. So, what is unsayable? What is fundamentally unsayable is this is this giving. What cannot be shown, but well, that's a question, maybe that's a question for Federico. Uh, what cannot be shown is showing. You can, that's why we, we can say it, we can have a word for it. But 
But we can show we can show things, but we cannot show the showing. We can only become aware of the fact that that there is showing. Just to confirm that I understand you right. I mean both of you. So I think of this um, in after virtue where uh, McIntyre um, tries to um, express, uh, tries to uh, uh, explain um, why is narrative uh, important. And he gives this example saying, just imagine you see a man working in the garden and you try to understand what he's doing. Of course you can see he's working in the garden, but you don't know why he's working in the garden. And without knowing why he's working in the garden, you fail to understand um, the meaning of him working in the garden. So his working in the garden could be that he likes garden, he just likes to interact with, uh, with the plants. Or because uh, his uh, wife is really fond of garden, so by him working in the garden, he tries to please his, his wife. Or he considers uh, working in the garden as a type of exercise. Well, he, he wants to do some exercise, but he does not like jogging. So uh, in the process when you uh, put working in the garden in a bigger narrative, which of course, provided that you really know the person, you somehow have the information source in order to acquire the bigger narrative background, you're able to make sense of him working in the garden. Why he's doing that and you have to understand. So in that case, so if I try to understand your explanation of uh, finitude, um, that is, uh, in order to have a word or in order to make sense of anything, uh, you have to have a limit yeah. which um, which facilitates you exactly. to understand what you try to understand. Yeah. Because if I just see this thing there without knowing anything about it, like in which condition, I feel to understand why this thing is here. Yeah. Is that what you In other words, and that's a very well known permanent principle, you need a horizon. So you need a horizon to have meaning. And and a horizon is, is that what you just said, I think. This, this narrative context it provides a horizon for understanding what that guy is doing in the garden. But without it, that you, you can't do anything with it. Um, so, a horizon is that which you know there's something behind it, but you'll never you'll never see it, because as you move, the horizon moves, moves with you. No? So this, the horizon is, although you can, you can bring things within your horizon, that doesn't mean the horizon goes away. So, so like, there's a, there's, there's a certain, you need a certain amount of context in order to have knowledge, like a certain amount of background information about people's motives, for example, to properly understand something, and that's like a, a lower, that's like a minimum requirement for knowledge, understanding, whatever. But then maybe there's like um, taking it to the other extreme, there's like an upper, upper limit on if you have, I don't know if this would be the right way of saying what you were saying, but that would like too much context of if you have too too much knowledge of. Um, I don't know, maybe it's different because it's more like I suppose you were like saying about perspectives and maybe that's different to background context or whatever, maybe they don't they can't be compared, but it that seemed more like um uh like an upper limit on what was required for knowledge. Um so there's like you need to you need to have a minimum but you don't want to have too much and you need to have something in the middle maybe. Yeah, if you so that is a parallel because if you imagine that you so so I, what I was trying to say was we, we, we very often think in a very unimaginative way about knowing everything. <laughs> we think you know oh yeah well you can just somebody might know everything. But if you even if it's the same with the the, 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 the person working in the garden. Suppose you've got and you know really everything <laughs> there is to know about about this situation. Then it also becomes rather, rather complex. Yeah, how drawing the line between what's relevant to a yeah, certain perception exactly. and what isn't. Yeah. So that that creates the meaning, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And so I think that maybe I don't know, but maybe that is what what Heidegger is sort of 
was playing there when he started to talk about design, uh, or Zeichnen, where he also talks about the template, something that's laid out for you to design, or later on, I don't know if you use the word here, it becomes chic. So sign, uh, chic. You know that he talks about that word, he uses this word geschick, which is uh, from schicken, which means to, to send. So language sends us, and geschick, and geschick is then also a fate, and that's also the word for, 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 for fate in German, the schicksal. The schicken also means schicke in, in Dutch, means to, uh, to organize, to order. Like, for example, a, a bunch of flowers in a vase. Or you, you, you uh, what's the word for that in English? You, so that's a chicken. <coughs> so, so it's a chicken. Yeah? You put them together in a nice way. So you've got a kind of chicken, an, an organization. Um, so this word chic points all of that out. Language being as language, language being, being language, sense, that's this from an eyewitness to us, sends this dispensation of what things mean, how the world means, the, the, the story of the, 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 why, is the, why, is the, why is the person in the garden? Yeah? Why did the duck cross the road? And that provides a framework, I don't use that word because you would say that's that's Gestell, that's, that, that's, that's, uh, that's technology, but, but so Geschick is what is not, not technology. Um, and that's given to us, and then we have to hear that, and if we do that, then we can speak. And that changes over time. So for, for Heidegger, the, 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 the fact that we're now caught up, what he talks about in his book all the time, this objectifying technological worldview where everything becomes information, um, that is also geschick. That in its so we, we can live with that today, not by as good Marxists fighting against it, wanting a humane world, etc. For Heidegger, no. For Heidegger, we have to learn to fully accept that. And once we, we do that, we can we can we can hear in in the, in the language that which cannot be said, but which lies behind that, and which sense this to us, right? And that is being itself. So it's our fate to become completely informationalized and artificialized and that's, yeah. Um, there are two, two things that came to mind from this reading and, and, and now listening to you even more. Um, I think that Heidegger here is not quoting the, the main source that is that is a reading from. I mean, he quotes the, the Stoics, but not of Plato a few times perhaps. But I, I think it's, there is a lot of the, the name of dialogue here, or something at least, especially when he talks about the showing and the the sign and owning, etc., and the appropriation, um, not only in terms of the, the saying um, and the showing, but also in terms of how, um, at least in Socratic terms, Socrates' teaching, and the Nemo there uh, uh, asks Nemo to call a slave, and the boy slave, and the first thing Socrates asks to name himself is, is he a Greek? Does he speak Greek? <laughs> Does he speak Greek? Knowing that the slave is also another language. Yes. Now others interpret that to can, you know, uh, uh, use different hermeneutics also uh, to that even against Heidegger when he says that he can only philosophize German and Greek, yeah. but uh, you know, and that's what he asks then. And then Socrates starts explaining and showing Nemo, uh, 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 Mino, sorry, is it? Is it? Yeah, the, how the, the saying becomes knowledge 
in fact for the slave. Talking about geometric figures. Yeah. Okay, if I have a square, he says, do you know that the square has got four lines and those four lines that delimit this figure are all the same? And on and on and on. It goes on for a few pages, even doubling the uh, the square, etc., and say, uh, what's the, the, the area covered by this? Yeah. And you can show that, that uh, uh, Socrates is showing that the, the, the slave doesn't know, and I'm not teaching, telling him, but taking out of him what is not said, actually. And what he didn't know was already present in him. So the magnetic exercise there of, of even the teaching. But more than that, perhaps, in, on what he was saying towards the end, uh, this uh, combination, he touches upon a few times on a, again on a, as gift on there is, and, and even uh, some point towards the end, you know, again on the gift. Um, the very last page of that translation when all reflective thinking is poetic, going back to, to perhaps those when we were talking about poetry, and all poetry in turn is a kind of thinking. We had this discussion a couple of yeah. weeks ago, you remember. Yeah. So the two belong together by virtue of that saying which has already been spoken itself and what is unspoken because it is a thought as a thanks. And, and here again comes the fact of, of the giving, mm -hmm. like you were saying. Yeah, and it's not just the giving which is given. Uh, and here comes the listening. I think that is very important for him. Um, it's a giving which is ascending. But this sending will proceed it if we are listening. Yes. Otherwise, it goes. And that's the problem with modernity, actually, and that's the problem with philosophy. Yeah, we don't listen. Yeah. We, you know, and I found a, a small quote in one of his first writings on, you know, when he wrote, um, I do have here the, 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 the German title, to I think he is, anyway, is, is reversing the title, like the bean and time, on time and being, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, those lectures there, yeah. and and he's talking about the sending in very strong terms, like you said. Um, in the beginning of Western thinking, being is thought, but not that it is as such, a script as such, or was a thought. The latter withdraws in favour of the gift which it gives. Yeah. The gift is thought and conceptualized from then on exclusively as being with regard to beings. A giving which gives only its gift, but in the giving holds itself back and withdraws. Such a giving we call sending. We so call sending. Yeah. It's exactly. the sending. The yeah, yeah, exactly. to, the, sending. Yeah. to the idea of sending which is which is extremely strong. Yeah. Uh, and, and on. So when, you send, on. when you send a gift, yeah. when you're not with the gift to give it. Exactly. But you say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, that's really relevant. Yeah, exactly. That's precisely it. Yeah, that's what this is. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's something, and, and for me this becomes very important because in my anthropological work on gift, uh, that I've been actually the name that in the middle of blood Sapinia, yeah. the name that they use to give is not a gift. They have a word for gift, yeah. uh, but it's something which is sent, <laughs> and it's called the sending. The sending is the gift. Yeah, yeah. the sending, as, which is a Latin word anyway, and which is in viatu, yeah. which is in vidam, in on via. the way, yeah, yeah. something on the way. So that's that's the, the idea of, wow. of the gift. Okay, so I'm, I'm connecting yeah. Heidegger with my 
with your with my villages. Yeah. <laughs> so in, 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 in that dialect, you can also think. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, you do. You do. Yeah. Say uh, in in Biare is the verb, uh, and uh, which is viaticum in Latin, yeah. you know, something on yeah. the road, yeah. something for the road. As 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 because it's, it goes from one house to another house. Yeah. So it's it's always sent. It's nothing that I give you. No, exactly. You know, it's hidden. No, everybody knows. Yeah. But it's circulating in the village. So it's something that is said. Oh, are you sending something? Yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you taking something to? Yes, I'm sending. Yeah, yes, yeah, I'm... yeah. Wonderful. And some of these gifts can never go back to the house, actually. Okay, so you have the but it's not. They cannot be given back. Exactly, yeah. cannot be given back. There is no return. That's, that's very There's muscle was, you know, the return of the gift yeah, yeah. that you have to give. No, the gift doesn't go back. <laughs> okay. So that that's very. I think that's that's wonderfully fascinating because this here, that's of course the same. I, I think it no, does. I think it does. I mean, it, it was challenging for me at the beginning when I started reading yeah. Heidegger seriously, but but then in the end, I think is, and that's why. It, 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 Quote, you know, and, and with language, I think is is the same. I think it's the same. It's, 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 <laughs> it's very close to that figure of speech. You know, when he says to be that way, actually, he uses something here. It's not just the way. Yeah. It means to bring a, a Way making understood in this sense no longer means to move something up and down a path that is already there. It means to bring the way forth, first of all, and thus to be the way, which becomes almost evangelical. Yeah, exactly. I am the way. I am the way. Yeah, so it's not you have the way, I show you the way. No, you are the way. You are the way. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, the way to language. Language is the way that shows you that we are finite. So how do, how do you make that link then to this, this death point? To the death? Yeah. The fact of the consciousness. You know, you, earlier on you said, you were saying about the fact that this is, that, that, you know, the language shows us that we are finite. It's not the language itself. I think is the consciousness uh, of, of being finite is found in language. That's what language tells me. Listening to language, I understand that even my words are finite. That I cannot say it all. I will not exactly. I cannot say it all. Like the example of the garden. And I love it. One of the reasons was also because the gardener was fed up with the wife talking to him. <laughs> Sorry, my dear. <laughs> Feminists wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, there's no <laughs> Anyway, no, no, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's true, anyways. It, it makes sense, you know. I see something, I, can, I want to talk, I want to say, I cannot say it all. Yeah. And that's consciousness. And that, I mean, that, and that is linked to the to the experience of death. Oh yeah, because it's a finitude. Yeah, I'm not a god. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I just have a guess because I think at first what always um, bothers me when I read Heidegger is um, the way he talks because he, he always say die Sprache, so the language. Although he's aware, mm -hmm. everyone is aware that a lot of languages should be plural, mm -hmm. but he never used the Use the um, uh, uh, how do you call it the uncertain particle. You now say a not the language. Mm -hmm. So uh, the whole time it appears to me as if he's trying to do is you know the, the typical idealism and uh, say there is this uh, very nature of language that is uh, shared by all the languages and now I'm trying to do the work telling you what is the very nature of the long, the, the language that every language shares. Mm -hmm. But then just through the discussion. It comes to me that I'm not sure whether he means it, but uh, what makes sense to me is um, uh, the being of the language is actually the being of a language. So the, the example that you gave, so you think about I give you a present. 
I give you a present in order to celebrate a your birthday. So in the sense of Wittgenstein, and the meaning of the present would be how you use it in the context, celebrate your, your birthday. Mm -hmm. But then, another way to understand the meaning of present is to really think about what these words tell us without thinking about in which context we use it. A couple of days ago, we, I talked with, with a friend about how in our generation, so computer, tablets, and smartphones change our lives. And then we talk about the concept of computer. And it never appears to me what computer means. Of course, I know how do I use computer to refer to which things, but it never too appears to me what computer means. And then I said, okay, I know computer means in Chinese, electric brain. <laughs> so when computer was introduced, so when this technology was introduced to Chinese languages, how it was per se, as what it means is that brain, but functions with electricity. Yeah. And it really, like you can say, present is on the way. So, I mean, this is one way to per se the meaning of language or of words without using it in the context. Yeah. But then, it, I don't think it is the nature to say it in a very um, ontological or metaphysical sense, but it's actually to go back to how the word, how one meaning with a certain word first come into existence. And in order to know what people at that time understands this existence, probably the application might change later on, just uh, you know, in different circumstances, new meanings will be attributed to this word. So in the end, one word has different meanings, and it always uh, depends on which context to use in order to choose one meaning. Yeah. But then if you go back in time, in order to figure out what the meaning of the word itself without being used, and you're able to understand me in the first place. So that, I think that's a very, very valuable remark. Remember I said at the beginning, I understand that also now better myself, I said I want to read this book decontextualized, mm -hmm. right? So maybe in order to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And um, it also, I, I also had a similar thought when you were talking. I thought, so this plurality of languages, and he struggles with that also with regards to, to a Humboldt, uh, Mm -hmm. The way he starts with that, he says, Humboldt writes his book about this, this the Jan, Jan, the Indonesian language, and he talks about the different Sprachbauten, the different language forms, yeah. and they're how they, how they reflect the mentality of the people. So there is this variety, and this diversity of language is really essential for, for that. And he says, uh, towards the end of his life, Humboldt had an inkling of a different relation to language. Um, presumably Heidegger's than that, because uh, uh, we know that the possibility of an innate transformation of language entered well into Humboldt's sphere of thought from a passage in his treatise on the diversity of the structure of human language, diversity. As his brother tells us in the foreword, Humboldt worked on this treatise lonesome near a grave until his death. <laughs> 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 so so he, he became aware that the variety of languages is not just, oh, there are varieties of ways in which the spirit expresses itself, but that this variety of languages is an experience of finitude, is this gift, and is therefore that which enables me to speak. So, so you're right to say this diversity of languages, that is itself an example of gift. And maybe, maybe if you, I, I thought that when we were talking, Maybe if you look at it from this perspective, you can also, that would be a way into what Heidegger is talking about slightly differently, maybe than what he explores, is to say, um, look at your mother tongue, look at the language that you have been taught to speak. That is a gift, right? Your, your language is a gift. Is a gift. Is something that's given to you, is sent. It's not even even your 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 mother and your father who taught you how to speak. They didn't give you that gift. They they passed it on, or they they, they used it. They were also using it as it were. But but it is a gift that and the sender is not is nowhere to be nowhere to be seen. But but you can experience if you if you move away from the causal framework then you can experience your mother tongue as, so, 
the initiation of a speaker into their mother language, you can experience that as receiving a gift that you then uh, you're stuck with. <laughs> you have to do something. Yeah. So, um, so that is, for example, because he I mean, always, um, I don't know how it's translated in English, uh, where he says uh, Verhältnis, so uh, relation. And he used it differently. So sometimes he just wrapped the word as it is, Verhältnis. Yeah. But sometimes mm -hmm. he also wrapped the word with a, with a slash in between. So Verhältnis. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a way to, to cling onto <coughs> that what is given. Yeah. So here it's more like, you know, emphasize that you also participate in the in the in the in, in this language, so not only you are given the language, where you are passing your saber, which is fehens, so this given relation. Yeah. And then once you realize that, this fehens becomes to your work, where you are the subject, because you understand the word and you find your way to claim from it, or you you realize that you are somehow restricted by it and you try to move away, but still this is the. It's the fairness that is subject to you, but I'm not sure it's mm, Yes, relation. There yeah. is our relation. And then, uh, where is it with the uh, hat? It's here. The fairness. Yes, you are asking the hat. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's translated the same. It's translated the same. Das Verhältnis und das Geläut der Stille. So, and you think this with the hyphen as a super meaning? Yeah, because because this word is throughout the passage. At first, I noticed it, but I don't know how to understand it. It's also actually in the beginning. So, in the beginning, the second paragraph, at the end. So you have um, the the passage of if we understand all that we shall now attempt to say as a sequence of statements about language. It will remain a chain of unverified and scientifically verifiable uh, propositions. But if, on the contrary, we experience the way to language in the light of what happens with the way itself as we go on, then an intimation, an intimation may come to us in virtue of which language will henceforth strike us as strange. But, but there is no mistranslation of how he how he write fair helpfulness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So how it, 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 it transforms from this given fair helpfulness, this given relationship, to a then relationship. Relationship. Um, yeah. So. Say okay. So the, the most uh, most easy to find is the the the, the, the second the, the second paragraph. So yeah. the beginning of the, yeah. uh, the second paragraph and um, and the last two words, and also on the last no yes the last page the last yeah. page but um, is the paragraph of um, just before where he come to Humboldt. You mean the, 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 at the end? Yes, at the end. We have one for Oh, here, put the verhältnis zur Sprache und sinnvolle Weise, nach der wir sie gebrauchten, in das Ereignis gehören. Yeah. Yes, and before that, you see the fair slash. Oh, here, yeah. yeah, yeah. Darum bleibt unser Sagen als Antwort in stets im Verhältnis achtigen. Das Verhältnis wird hier überall aus dem Ereignis gedacht und nicht mehr in der Form und bloß die Beziehung vorgestellt. Unser Verhältnis zur Sprache bestimmt aus der Weisheit der Wir und die Gebrauch des Ereignis. Ja, exactly. So, by splitting it up, you move from the old thing to the ontological. Right? Verhältnis is relation. Verhältnis. Is how we are held by the ereignis, mm. and uh, also by the event. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's it, right? 
Yeah, there were, and there are actually more position, more uh, uh, positions, but so these two are most easy to find. Yeah, yeah but is it because he is speaking about that relation of all relations? This yeah. thing? Yeah. Das Verhältnis, die, die, wenn alle Verhältnisse, Moment, also bewegt. Das werden wir jetzt hier überall aus dem Ereignis gehabt und nicht mehr in der Form der großen Beziehung vorgestellt. So not, not, just, uh, not just understood as how it is given, but... Um, ah, okay. Das Verhältnis aller Verhältnisse. Okay. So this, this is a, a key concept related with Ereignis in this sense. And so you, so you think that this world, the word Verhältnis, when, when it's separated, it, uh, it could be related with the, with the concept of Ereignis, as in... That I'm not sure, but just how I understand, because he, he always uses a specific word in order to, uh, in order to uh, make his uh, point. And uh, because he, he used this Verhältnis, in a lot of places, okay. so I just try to understand how he understands, for example, this transformation. From the beginning, you just use the language as how it is given, mm -hmm. and then when you realize your relationship with or to the language, um, I mean, as a speaker, for example, then how you can somehow change your relationship with the language, where it becomes that it's not how it is given, but yeah. you try to. Mm -hmm. Your, your relation is source. Yeah, so yeah, just yeah. How I understand. Okay, isn't there also a kind of wordplay there with verhalten? Uh, halten means to hold. Mm -hmm. Verhalten means, means yeah, bad behavior. Uh, but but um, verhalten is is fair, which means also a an over, uh, going beyond, like in uh, to be in love. Is verliebt, lieben, verlieben. Uh, so it's it is a going going in transgressing transgressive form as it were, yeah? uh, form as it were. So verhalten also yeah. It, so the word indicates that this holding itself that there's something going on with it, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe, maybe that that is that's maybe also why he, why he, he, he emphasizes. By putting a hyphen, he splits it into halten, holding, and then an, an overholding, as it were. So yeah, then, and this, oh, right, this is an overhold. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, maybe that would be translation for it. Um, yeah, that's not a word in English, but that's what, how you could maybe remove it. Uh, all, all, thought, all thought is uh, poetry. So. <laughs> Um, I always, I always think, but uh, I think we should put it. But I also think there is something about this Verhalten that has to do with this reservation. With so with reservation. Mm -hmm. So uh, holding yourself back, which is what language is doing. Mm -hmm. In, in sending us the kashik, the gift, but it's also our attitude towards language. So that's, that's this mim it's mimesis that uh, Federico mentioned. We also should be holding back with respect to language. So this is the modern, anti modern, anti modernism moment. So we, we don't, thanks to our own thing to make and to, to make it do what we want. We should have a, an, a, an attitude of, a, of a re reservation and respect, of holding back. And I think that is also, not that he, uh, well, maybe does. Um, I think that's also in that word, for Altenheit, that, that sounds shrinked mid empty, I think. Um, so, yeah. Uh, because uh, to, uh, um, das, um dem Sprachwesen nachzudenken, in order to pursue a thought of being of language, to say of it what is its own, 
a transformation of language is needed, which we can neither compel nor invent. This transformation does not result from the procurement of uniform words and phrases. It touches on our relation to language, which is determined by destiny. Whether and in what way the nature of language is the art tidying of appropriation will retain us in appropriation. For that appropriating, holding, self-retaining is the relation of all relations. Thus our saying always an answer and remains kind of relational. So uh, yeah, remains relational, remains verhalten. Eigenhalten, anzighalten. Daarom blijft onze zaken als antwoord een steeds in verhelpenis achtigen. Het seems to me that, that een einbehouden. Dus een eigenis is in die zin einbehouden meer. So het is een holding. En all the, all the associations with the word holding start to, to uh, echo here. You know? Uh, <coughs> Also, the gift that then you receive, you hold it. Yeah. If you respect and receive the gift, you you hold it, right? As, if you don't hold, hang on to your gift, then the, the, the next time they're going to be very cross with you. Um, And it is really only the fact that, that we die, that the fact that we know that we die, that makes us possible recipients for this gift. So we are, we are then gebraucht. As he says, unsere Verhältnis zur Sprache bestimmt sich aus der Weise, nach der wir auf die Gebrauchten in das Ereignis gehören. Uh, our relation to language defines itself in terms of the mode in which we who are needed in the uses of, usage of language belong to appropriation. We need, we need to die, to know that we die, in order to receive the gift of language. It still escapes me. He said that in the text himself, yeah? this escapes us. <laughs> it escapes me. I, can't, I want to say, oh yeah, now I get it. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I can't. Why, why being mortal makes us suitable recipients of the. Yeah, language. yeah, yeah. Do so you get it? No, 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 not fully. Really. You get it. <laughs> you get it. Mm -hmm. um. Um, so, so it's um, we, we've got a different. Um, we've got a much more sophisticated attitude to death than animals that we. Um, we don't just, uh, the body doesn't just break down until we have like, the conception of not existing. So, I mean, is, is it that um, we have an idea what non existence might be like, and that's kind of what enables us to appreciate existence and the gift of being or whatever that's disclosed through language? I mean, you know, is, is it death as non existence versus uh, or be, be yeah. Um, yeah. us? But then there's this thing you're saying about finitude as well, which is was interesting and slightly different. Yeah. Yes, but that's a good point. So in the fact we know that we die, that means we have a conception out of vague of nothing, nothingness. And therefore we have a conception of that from which language is given to us. And the way he sees it. Maybe. Yeah, and so and we need to have that. And so we, we, in order to, 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 to belong to language, we need to transform our relation to language, and that means to experience it as that, 
But that can only happen if we know that we die, if we have a sense of nothing, no existence. Um, and at the same time, they belong together for Heidegger so closely that it's only because, so, so it's also only because we have language that we can actually do that. So it's, it's uh, yeah, okay, that's helpful, that's correct. Yeah. And then also the awareness that we're going to do with the access to the language. Yeah. That we can use it, maybe. One, one, one thing, yeah. Once we're aware of. That there will be a time where we can't aware of it. Yeah. Become, yeah, we, we lose communication, we lose awareness, supposedly. We don't know what that is. Yeah. So maybe not, but. At least we know that we don't know this. Yeah. 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 That's true, yeah. So that, and then that's, that's, that is very much in parallel with the analysis of science and order, being, being towards death, on to death, in the, in the time and sight. It's that sense that gives me a sense of possibility, and that I should, should take my possibilities, realize my possibilities. Um, because death is the end of all possibilities. Um, but that, in again, really in terms is also the fact of looking from from a Levinasian perspective, the fact that I'm kind of centered on my own death. Yeah, that makes so as the end of it because of that. Um, but that's also the problem with uh, Western philosophy, yeah. which is a philosophy of ecology, the same. Yeah. And that's why he calls it a monologue. So yes, that's right, he gets to that at the end. Uh, yeah. I think that, that that's where it becomes, I think, you know, becomes a monologue, even though he's pushed towards, because there is one page where he names monologue, and then the other page, soon after, is talking about, thus I was saying, always an answering, yeah. So it's not a monologue, yeah. always an answer, remains forever uh, relational. Yeah. How can it be relational, you know, if there is this? Uh, but language is monologue. Language is monologue, and it even has, yes. again, it goes on to this etymological. And the same, you know, know it's the same. Die Sprache allein ist, dass die Eigen spricht, und die spricht einsam, speaks einsam, lonely, that sound. Yeah. Oh, Sound yeah. is the same. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's also. And it goes to the yeah. Gothic Sama, the Greek Hama, <laughs> yeah. and the English same. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. And some and lonesome is the Gothic Sama, the Greek Hama, and the English same. And that's the same as in uh, the Mind Zaman. So, so lonesome. And uh, uh, what is what it says here? And in rapports, it says, uh, but, but in, in, uh, in, uh, in German it says gemeinsam. Gemeinsam means common, in common. Uh, and that has the same sound, gemeinsam and einsam. So to stress that, that the, the, yeah. the lonesome one is in common, is together. Yeah. Saying that shows, say, cool, yeah. So now you say, so, yeah, okay, but, but then language remains forever relational. Um, is that? As, yeah, towards the end. Darum bleibt unsere Sage als Antworten. Does our saying always an answering remains to a relation? Because we are answering language. Yeah. But not each other. Yeah. In a sense, yes. Yeah. So when we are hearing language, and language speaks to us, and then we respond. Which makes sense in the game in terms, and that's why, you know, the language in, in Levinasian terms is the face of the other talking to me. So yeah, that's very different. There is no other, it's not, it's not language itself. Yeah. But wouldn't Heidegger say to Levinas then, by leaving us, you're doing the same as Humboldt. You're, you're uh, understanding language in terms of something else. What about his language 
that the other is using to talk to me. That's the problem that Levinas, I think, would say that that's the, the, the primary language is not what I hear or what I want to hear, or language itself, let us call it the same of language, but it's what Yama is telling me. That's the language. So it's the face, the face of the other talking to me is, is, is my first philosophy, in a sense. So my thinking starts not with understanding, not with knowledge, like he wants here, but with that ethics. You know, because I'm uses with the French Latin assessment, you know, here is the understanding is uh, of uh, comprendre is a matter of taking yeah. the prompt, taking away. That's what I'm doing. So I am appropriating something. And he talks yeah, about appropriation. Yeah. Okay, and that's why I think Levin is also calling here and replying to him saying, I don't want to appropriate. Yeah. Uh, I cannot in fact appropriate. You know, real knowledge starts with the, as the other telling me and, and then at that point my death is not that important, yeah. but it's the death of the other that becomes meaningful. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a different level of understanding in a sense, and it puts into question the way, not the way to language, but the way to philosophy. Yeah. So right. Western philosophy has been, has failed itself from, from, from this point of view of understanding. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is, yeah, very strong in self-understanding, and understanding the I, the ego, but not not understanding each other here, really, especially the other. Know yourself, yeah. No, yeah. Know yourself, no, 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 the other. Yeah, yeah. 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 And another thing that I have to say, precisely on that point, is that, uh, which is also uh, marks the difference between you know, Humboldt and, and Levinas, is that, the answer to the other comes before he speaks to me. Yeah. So first of all, there's an answer, and I have to answer even before understanding it. And this, I think, I think a completely different way of looking to also a linguistic relation with the other, uh, rather than um, the the Humboldt one. This uh, yeah. this answering before. Uh, Something is being said to me. Yeah, because the other, the other appeals to me or addresses me. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. It, it, the, the, the face of the other is sufficient for me to answer him. Yeah. And uh, so so that uh, I like. There's a kind of obedience also in the finance, but yeah, of uh, it, it's like a, the reverse of, of uh, in a sense of, of what Heidegger calls of the hearing or. Uh, all the obedience we can we can find in, in Heidegger in a certain sense, I think. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Jackson, maybe need to read Levinas next time. <laughs> um, yes. It's time time to stop. Um, Okay, I think we've we've uh, yeah we've come some way to understanding this this the way to language and and what that means to to, to from the point of view of going that way and we have to have problematized or come to understand that although we are already speaking language we can change our relation to language and if, and if we do that in the sense which Heidegger talks about it then we are. We do that because we are sterblich, and it puts us into an authentic, more authentic relation to language. And so next time, um, we're going to look at this uh, uh, das Wort, I think, yeah? Words, words, words. words. Uh, And that is, um, oh yeah, that is a good example problem as well. This is Nostradamus, this chapter. 
So we're talking about poetry there. And we're moving, so we've talked about language, and so there is a, there is a rationale to it. We talked about the essence of language, the nature of language. And we talked about this way to language. We already spoke about the difference between the whole machinery of language, production, and saying. And now we're going to ask the question, so what happens when we say, then we say words. So there is an opportunity for us to think about what this word is. The saying happens in words, or even if we say without <coughs> words, then we say it deliberately, then it's good because we don't use words, that we say something. Uh, so if we, if we say something without words, it's because we don't use words, that something is said. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I thought I think it was a really good discussion, and we uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in, in two weeks' time. And those who want to join us uh, for a drink at the pub, we're going to the rise of the sun, that's all.